What's going on, juicers? Welcome to episode 31 of the Juice Box Podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by Frank Sandoval, a.k.a. Frankly Shredded on Instagram, a.k.a. My Roommate. On this episode, we dove into a lot of stuff involving bodybuilding, uh, bodybuilding competition, misconceptions involving steroids, and all that good stuff. We talked about his co-founded company, Origamis, some industrial graphic design information was talked about on this episode as well and a couple things we missed out on due to covid Um, anyways i had a great time on this episode i hope he did as well and i hope you guys enjoy listening to this one enjoy the episode catch you on the next one later studio yeah wouldn't it be nice to have a bigger studio? <laughs> um, Maybe eventually. Yeah. So anyways, Frank, welcome to the Juice Box Podcast, dude. <laughs> How's it been, man? It's been uh, it's been good. Juicers, this is my roommate. One of the two roommates that I have. His name is Frank. He's an Italian stallion. And he's an IFBB pro. How does that feel, dude? Feels okay. Does I think it? it's uh, hyped up. You think so? Yeah. Well, Especially when that? I talk to uh, new competitors. Yeah. It's like the first thing they want to do. Like, you want to that's their goal. You want to explain what an IFBB Pro means? It's the International Federation of Bodybuilders. So Dang, pretty much, dude. <laughs> sounds so cool when you say it like that. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way. <laughs> Fuck, dude. I mean, that title is like, it's obviously hard to achieve. Yeah, it was pretty much what Arnold competed as. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Love that guy. Yeah. So, pretty much the big league right now is the NPC. Yeah. That's like the main one because there is the natural bodybuilder shows and stuff like that, but that's more like mom and pop, you'd say, yeah, or yeah. like minor leagues. Smaller, and smaller organizations. Yeah, smaller. Um, so the NPC is the National Physique Committee, and that's the one that everybody pretty much does that one. And with that one, if you turn pro, and that one is what gets you into the IFBB. Okay. League. And how long, how many, uh, does yours sound okay, by the way? Yeah. Okay. How many NPC wins? Do you need to get to qualify for an IFBB? Yeah, so there's uh, district level shows in the NPC, and then there's national level shows. Yeah. So pretty much you start, I mean, you can go straight to, and let me, it's been a while since I competed. Yeah. So you have to qualify to compete in a national level show. Okay, yeah. So yeah. you compete in the district level shows. Everybody starts in the district level shows. Um, once you place, I can't remember because they change it all the time, the top to the top three once you place in the top three we'll say in a district level show that qualifies you for the national level show okay and then it used to be like when i competed you had to get first place in the national level show for you to turn pro and then they started expanding it to second place right. even got a pro oh, card really yeah which oh, i that's i have mixed feelings on you that know sucks that's actually i feel like that's terrible yeah, I feel like they were doing it to get more competitors. Yeah. You know, incentivizing it. And like, how many oh, years even ago, if you play second, you still get a pro that? card. W- that I competed or no, that they're doing that? No, that they started doing second place. Okay, you qualify. I think that started a year or two after I started competing in 2012. So it was probably like 2015. Okay. And they still do it now, I believe. Damn. Yeah. So what? I think they're just looking, like I said, like attract more competitors because right. they're going to make more money. Yeah, it's yeah. Like the promoters, the more people compete, the more money they get. Right. And that's the other thing. It's like you have to pay for not only all the prep, but you have to pay to compete. Yeah. So you have to get your NPC card, which is a yearly fee. And then you have to pay registration for each show for each division that you compete in. Compete in. Yeah. Because some people might do um, bodybuilding and physique. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so really quick, just for some background, uh, Frank and I, we met at the gym at 24 San Carlos like a couple of years ago. And I was, uh, I had just switched over from uh, Crunch, Reddit City 224, and I, uh, I kind of had like my own little friend group there that was already going there, like Dylan, Derek, those guys. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think we probably met like, I don't even remember how long after I started going there. It was probably a while. You were like one of those dudes that I was like kind of like trying to stay away from just because <laughs> like I was like intimidated by all the big guys. Yeah. And at the time I was still like not very, um, very big yet so i was just like yeah. trying to like do my own thing whatever and then i remember one time i was doing squats and ramiro came up to me and then you came up after and then like we just like 
we all just like kept talking for a while. Mm-hmm. So anyways, um, yeah, I like right off the bat, I, I was like, dude, you specifically, because I knew I had known that you'd competed. I can't remember how I knew that. I think De- uh, Derek might have told me or something. But I was like, oh, okay, so he fucking, he's like in it. Like you like you're doing your thing in the gym and shit like that. And I didn't yeah. know if you still competed at the time. But when, by the way, this is gonna be like this first part's like a fitness talk. I would imagine it's kind of where we're headed. Um, but we're probably gonna dive into some other business shit too. So stay tuned, guys. <laughs> um, when, when you. Take me through like when you start like why did, why you started working out and then just like the evolution of the the fitness journey for you because I feel like a lot of people I mean everybody has a different story everyone has a different reason why they started mm-hmm. why they decided to go the route that they did whether it's their style of training their style of dieting uh, what specific goals are that they set and how often those goals are changed based off of them not being able to achieve those goals in the window of time that they thought they would right um, what how did you kind of map your route out? Yeah, so mine, I think, is kind of a little unusual to how it is now, just because, like I said earlier, it's like more hyped up now. Yeah, for sure. So when I was doing it, or when I considered it, um, and when I started, it was physique wasn't even really a thing. Mm-hmm. So when I first started working out was in high school. Um, there was a class called Body Conditioning. Coach Smith, shout out to that guy. Hopefully he's doing shout well. Out. Um, <laughs> and this was... This is what year? Uh, oh, you want to you <laughs> time date it? <laughs> well, this was 2000. So I graduated high school in 2004, believe it or not. Dang, ladies and gentlemen. Dude. <laughs> Youngest man alive. Yes, Hell sir. Yeah. So this was like 2003, 2004. I can't remember if I did it junior or senior year or both. But that's where I got introduced to, introduced to bodybuilding. Okay. Um, that class was like learning all the basics and, um, you know, bench press, squat and all that. I probably still have my my little card where we recorded all our PRs when you were sorry to interrupt you, but when you were doing that, Mm -hmm. uh, did they, did they give you solid form? Yes. Did they actually, I mean, when you're young, I mean, he can't keep his eye on everybody. Obviously a full class of people working out. Right. So he at least tried to teach proper form. Now, if that was being executed, like we see in the gym now, especially with young guys, it's like, doesn't get executed all the time right right i just remember in high school uh because most of the weight training teachers they were all sports coaches Mm -hmm. and like they i just remember being taught how to squat Mm -hmm. and at the time like okay now i know how to squat Mm -hmm. when we were doing our prs uh we have to do them at like the end of every whatever quarter semester whatever um it was my squat pr and i did 225 but i went I went like so high above parallel yeah. that it was ridiculous. And they used to do it so that we would like sit on like a thing, you know, like where you touch squat. it. Yeah. yeah you like touch a it. box squat. Box squat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we would do that. And then uh, even even shit like bench press and whatever. And then when I got into working out, because that that class was like my sophomore year of high school. Mm-hmm. I thought I was like the shit. I was like, oh, I know how to lift now, whatever. I didn't continue lip working out until after I graduated. So there was like a two and a half year gap between that. Right. Once I actually started learning form and like working out and just in general, I was like, oh, all that shit in weight training was bullshit. Like <laughs> so crazy. Like no one went like ass to grass or like uh, parallel even on their squats. At least not that I remember. Yeah. But it's just funny to think back on the the um the the form that was taught yeah it all depends on who was teaching Teacher, you yeah, yeah exactly. because I remember yeah Coach Smith specifically was I don't think he coached any sports so I think this was his thing that he focused on and so I remember him forcing us you know go ass to grass I can't remember if that was one of his terms but was he jacked uh probably when he was younger okay um he was just like a bigger bigger older guy at yeah. that point. But yeah, um, he'd always yell out "home baby" and get us into the mood, you know, type <laughs> like of thing, a, like, like a Ronnie Coleman up. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. That's what reminded me. Of. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so anyways, that was fun. You started. You started in that that class. Yeah, in high school, and then right out of high school, I started going to college in San Francisco Academy of Art University. Yeah. Uh, for design, and that took up so much of my time that when I was going to school, I wasn't able to work out. Okay. At all. Um, I pull all nighters and that sort of thing. So how, how long? Uh, um, so then I would work out between semesters. Okay. And then I would gain a little bit muscle back because when I didn't work out, I would get skinny. Same. You that's, know that that's fast my metabolism. Yeah. Um, that is my problem. 
Yeah. So I would gain it back, you know, between semesters and I start going to school and I'd lose it again. By the way, people hate us for saying that. What? Every time oh, I yeah, tell hard s- gainer? Or, no, 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 no. Every time I tell somebody they when don't I work don't out. work out or eat, I yeah. lose a ton of weight. Right. And they're like, that must be nice. I'm like, right. yeah, it must be nice to be six foot two. So that's awesome. <laughs> well, it does change as you get yeah, older, yeah, too. Yeah. Now that I would imagine. Down. I've noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, sorry, you just said, uh, you started between semesters, in, yeah. I'd work out. Yeah. And then, um, so between semesters, I go to Gold's Gym uh, by my house and gain a little weight back. And then, so when I finally ended school, I started getting consistent in the gym again. That's when I was going to 24 San Carlos. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, just being consistent, starting to see the gains come back and getting all excited about it and working out with people who knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and then at that time, I had a buddy, Steve, who I was working out with, and his girlfriend was competing in bikini. Nice. Um, at that time. Uh, so in the women's, you was know. Was he competing too or no? No, no. So we were just working out just, just for fun. And yeah. Yeah. Just to see our, the progress. And so it stuck with you then from high school. Like, you would always kind of just really enjoy training from the start. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't happen with me. No. No, it's just... The reason I got into it was because the girl I was dating at the time, I went to go visit her at college, and Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, (laughs) I'm the smallest guy here. So then I was (laughs) like, I got to start going to the gym. So then that's that's when I started, and that was after I graduated high school. But when I was in weight training was, like, sophomore year of high school. So I don't know what it was. I was also a skater, so it was like... Yeah. There was, like, this stigma around... Uh, being a skater where it's like well you can't you can't be a jacked skater or something i don't know it was weird but <laughs> never got into it what didn't spark my interest until after yeah i can't remember because when i the year after i graduated high school i was super into the emo scene um emo, and i was skinny yeah. emo kid so it was like <laughs> was i working out then that's what gets a little fuzzy that i can't remember yeah what happened. I was skinny i don't know yeah if i was still working out then or i was just preoccupied like you with skating right i was preoccupied with other things mm-hmm. um but yeah, it's just one of the, like, I, I don't know. I had like a lot of phases yeah. when I was growing up. I yeah. Mean, I'm still I think we up, all do. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, dude, I mean, it's a, it's a game changer when you really get into it for me at least, because I feel like a lot of people have the intention of just wanting to like better themselves, get in better shape and shit like that. And that's all cool and everything. But then when they start working out, it's such a, it's such a taxing hobby, like mm-hmm. physically. I mean, but even like emotionally, it does kind of lift your spirits in a way. Like that's how oh, you, yeah. that's how you relieve it's, stress and yep, shit like that. Endorphins. Yeah. So it's a scientific, scientific fact. Right. And when you work out, it releases endorphins. But and I make you feel, feel like good. that doesn't always uh, click with some people because um, obviously it helps with like your mental health in some sort of aspect, not necessarily yeah. all the time, but uh, people just find it at such a physical challenge that they mm-hmm. just don't keep continuing it right the uh, consistency yeah is the hardest but the best part of it like that's that's where you get the most benefits right if you can be consistent that's what i tell people all the time it's yeah like if you can work out consistently even two days a week three days a week yeah that's it do that as long as you can be consistent don't go full force and, and do it five days six days a week right especially if there's no need to do it yeah, I mean, um, I re- well, when I first started, I was trying to do like four days a week, and uh, that was that was like perfect because I'm like a new kid trying to learn how to work out, and then I I'm obviously getting sore as shit, and then I'm like, oh, but I really feel good, like mm-hmm. I feel better about myself. Um, I'm like 125 pounds at the time. Yeah, and I'm like I put on a, like a couple pounds of weight because I graduated high school at like just below like 120 because. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I started tracking my weight at. Um, and then, like, I gained a little bit of weight. I'm, like, starting to see a little bit of development. And I'm just, like, Feels stoked good. the whole time. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, holy shit, dude. Like, whatever I'm doing is working. Yeah. And then, like, also a cool thing about when I started was, like, the height of, like... I talked about this with Alexa, my podcast, where mm. I, when I started working out, it was, like, the height of Gymshark. And then and, and the Alphalete was starting. And, like, all those guys... So you have the whole scene and yeah, and I have excited, like yeah. all like this good information to go off of because right. there's a lot of shit on the internet mm-hmm. that people are just so um, oblivious to, and then they just accept whatever they see. Yeah. Like lose lose twenty pounds of body fat in a week and a half, and right. then like everyone's like, "Oh, I'm gonna click that." Yeah, because it's all about that instant gratification, right? Especially that's what now. everybody wants: quick results. Yeah, and that's, on demand, right? Everything, but um. 
yeah, back to the journey. Like I, Oh, sorry. Yeah. We totally digressed. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Uh, just so we can complete that yeah, little yeah. chapter. But I, uh, so I was working out with Steve, um, at that time, what was super motivating to me was just seeing, like you said, like your body change, right. you getting all excited about that, especially when you're consistent. And that's what I was at the time was super consistent and all your, um, your lifts are getting heavier and that sort of thing. And so I just want to see where I can take my physique. Like, I want to see what my ultimate potential, or you might say like your genetic potential. Right. Right. I just want to see what my potential was. So that's why I was super consistent working out 110%. And then uh, Steve's girlfriend, who I mentioned was competing in bikini at the time, she brought to our attention that they're introducing a new division in bodybuilding because at the time it was only bodybuilding. Right. And I never thought about competing because I didn't see myself as a bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all pretty much uh, roided out, dudes. Like, you have to take steroids and um, get this. This was your thoughts when she told you that. Right, yeah. right. Or before and when she told us was I had no intention of doing that stuff because that's how it was. Yeah. And I never saw myself being on stage or needing or having the need to prove anything to anybody. Like that just wasn't me. Like getting on stage naked, ha- not naked, but pretty, pretty much, much yeah. or half naked in front of hundreds of people mm-hmm. and flexing. And I just thought it was ridiculous. You like, thought it was super bro and like. Yeah. Like yeah. why? Like That's what I thought too. When yeah. When I first thought of or when I first found out about it. Right. And then so she said that there's this new division called Men's Physique. You wear board shorts. It's more like a fitness model type of thing, more of a natural physique, mm-hmm. we'll say. You know, not all this roided out, uh, muscle-bound physiques. Yeah, because the difference between um, men's physique versus bodybuilding mm-hmm. um, is like a bodybuilder's frame usually on stage versus a physique is what, like double the size and different yeah. posing. Yeah, bodybuilding versus the physique. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You wear board shorts instead of those are called posing trunks, believe it or not. Those yeah. are speedo looking things right, that they right, wear, right. the bodybuilders. Um, the posing is different. So you do mandatory poses in bodybuilding. You do a posing routine Yeah. Um, to music. So you mm-hmm. have to figure that out, the choreography with that. Yeah. And then physique, you just go up there and you do, I don't know if it's still called what we call the time was uh, model poses. Yeah which stems from like fitness modeling. And there are standard now poses for physique. Right. But you don't go up there and freestyle it. You pretty much, I mean, you go up there and you get, like the bodybuilders get a minute, minute oh, and a half that's a for their time. posing routine. Yeah. For men's physique, you go, you hit your, it's like three to four poses and then you file off. Right. Um, and so whatever you can do in there, you want to, you know, make an impression on the judges. And then after that, they decide on the top, five and then they call you out and then yep. they do mandatory poses for that front and back yeah and compare from and there there's like five guys lined up and mm-hmm. then they call out a pose and they all have to do it at the same time yeah 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 they usually just say turn to the back mm-hmm. turn to the front usually they do front and back comparisons um but so where she, was i with she the, tells you about yeah men's physique yeah so she you, tells them men's physique and still then i was like oh no no desire to compete type of thing how soon is this was was in this your, was 2011 but like how many how long had you been lifting um i had been lifting for a good four years i was gonna say it's like four or five years right yeah, yeah. consistently for that long so you already like have a well-established foundation at the point oh definitely yeah okay yeah yeah um yeah my physique was definitely on par with yeah competing nice um and so i was yeah so we thought about it steve and i and it, at initially we're like no 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 like we don't need to do that and then um i don't know what happened we're just like fuck it let's do it for fun mm-hmm. let's how you know, see he? what happens uh we're about the same age okay i can't remember exactly all these but we're about the same age nice and um so this was two weeks before the competition they were like okay let's do it <laughs> that competition <laughs> yes our first competition oh ever. shit my first competition ever we're two weeks out fuck um i went to uh san carlos max muscle at the time the uh, i talked to the owner yeah, yeah steve i think his name is steve right laurel street yeah I, he used to go I to think. san carlos 24 i used to talk to him there yeah and he talked to him we mentioned that we were gonna do this competition he's like oh i know this guy um who's in that scene and he gave us his contact info i contacted him he's like yeah come meet us at gold's gym now it's uh, American Barbell in Santa Clara, mm. and um, or in Campbell. It's the Campbell one. Yeah. And uh, so we went down there, met him, and he was posing with a bodybuilder at the time. And uh, he's like, yeah, let's just go through some basic posing. He ended up being a – him himself was a national-level competitor back in the day, okay. bodybuilder. Um, and then now what he did 
was he coached competitors and he also was a district level judge in the okay. NPC. So he judged and coached competitors. Um, he was coaching and judge or posing with a bodybuilder there in the cycling studio at that gym. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, this is going to be one of the first shows that has this new division men's physique. He didn't really know what to expect from it. We didn't know. So he's like, let's just go through some basic like bodybuilder style poses. Right. Like he had some idea that it wasn't going to be as intense as bodybuilding. It was going to be a little bit more relaxed. So we went through those and pretty much just soaked up as much knowledge yeah. as he gave us for just the scene and competing in general. Right. And, you know, when I say I'm going to do something, I commit to it like yeah. 110%. So I practiced because he said, you know, you need to practice, practice, practice like all the time. Like even in the middle of your workouts. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Just pose it. And I so used to do like before and after go into the studio at the gym and pose after for like uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after my workouts um, and just super get into it and visualize. Yeah. And that's where I picked up a lot of, I think, the values and how I became so successful so quickly was not only the fact of you going through it, but also the mentality yeah. and the uh, mental part of it was that, you know, visualizing it, visualizing you on stage, like trying to go through it as much as possible, like you're imitating as if you're up there. Right. Um, not becoming dependent on the mirror, like closing. So I'd close my eyes, I would hit the pose and then I'd open my eyes to check the pose. So that kind of trained me not to come to depend on the mirror because then if you're using the mirror all the time, then you get up on stage, there's no mirror on stage. Yeah. What are you exactly. going to do? You can't make that mind and muscle connection of how you need to flex and pose these poses. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what I kind of passed on that knowledge to guys that I would help. Yeah. That would come in and I would be opposing. I haven't done it um, lately, but I would offer those services myself to yeah. kind of try to pass that knowledge down and get into that mental aspect instead of just taking them through, through poses, which I think is super valuable. Yeah, I think that's cool because, I mean, I think it's sick actually how pretty much right off the bat you were just like, let's fucking kick this thing into gear and let's just get after it. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's cool that, um, you know, that guy that you went to go see, mm -hmm. I wonder if you got anybody else to go see instead of that guy, what, it, what would have been different, you know? Cause, yeah, cause what, they that, that kind of led me there. Yeah, right. Because they, they, you know, everyone has. I mean, I imagine all uh, posing coaches or whatever kind of coach he was. Mm -hmm. They all have their own different taste, and, and there's they all so have, many now. Yeah, and they and all have. Like you don't know I'm if they're sure, good or not. Exactly, and and I mean, I would say the majority of people that are doing it probably shouldn't be doing it. Not majority, but a good percentage because of them. they're taking advantage of the hype and exactly everybody doing it. They're like, oh, I can um, bank on this, right? And make money on this, and um, uh. It's just funny, like, whatever he said and the way he said it and the cadence that he said it in mm -hmm. just, like, clicked with you. And right. that's pretty sick because, yeah. I mean, everyone has their own, like, their own spiel or their own selling point or whatever. And he sold you on the idea of competing or whatever it was, getting to posing and make right. sure you practice your posing. And it, whatever it did fucking um, made you excited enough to want to continue through with it. Yeah. So, yeah. respect to that His guy. name is uh, Aaron Fisher, by the way. He's past since oh. then oh that's right yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I oh I, yeah you show me him yeah Damn. i never met him you said he used to go to 24 in san carlos right he did sometimes yeah, yeah we used to train together there that was that was what like two years ago now three years ago uh, that he passed yeah he, it was like three or four years ago now okay, yeah. yeah yeah i had already we'd already met by then right I, yeah i remember you told me that that's sad <laughs> great guy obviously um that's the other thing too with that he <laughs> was a great guy as far as like he didn't ask for a lot of money up front, like wasn't about money for yeah, him. Yeah, it was just... It's more about him helping out. Right. And that's what kind of um, spoke to me. And that's how kind of I am, you yeah. know, and that's how... And then I passed it along to competitors that I try to help too. Yeah. It's like money is not the first thing with me. It's like I just want to see them be successful and why not pass on the knowledge? Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, Which really quick is another reason why I really appreciate like the big guy like Matt Ogus, Chris Lovato, mm -hmm. the Gymshark guys, like they didn't have to fucking give out all this fitness information out for free. Like they could have just did what normal. I mean, they have their own plans and shit, you know, mm -hmm. that people can buy their specific training programs, um, diet programs, whatever. But for the most, for like the majority of that's all like 
specifically for a person mm-hmm. whereas like the the general mass information that they give out is all for free on youtube and yeah, like people that, that's that how should be yeah exactly i mean not to get into marketing but that is just give away as much free information as you can yeah like useful that, and i mean useful but like yeah it, shit that is credible <laughs> and works you know? right right yeah but that's what's going to sell them is if that free information that you're putting out is real if it works you know yeah I obviously mean, you have to do research research but it's that's why I, that's that's why like I got so into all the fitness YouTubers when I did mm-hmm. like Christian Guzman, Max Tuning, like all those fucking guys. They're all like you know they have their business and shit, but they all started from just doing that kind of stuff. Whereas they're just giving out all this information, dieting tips, how yeah. to train the right way, when to take a break or whatever it is. Right. Like all that shit because I fell for a couple of like things like get get jacked in two weeks and like shit like that i, bl- I think everybody does everyone yeah. <laughs> has that point because they obviously you know i had my i had my i want the results tomorrow kind of mindset i mean but that's just because you know especially was, when you're young too yeah i was it's 18 like, year old 18 year old kid and yeah, i was like for the summer you want to yeah. look jacked yeah, yeah yeah we all work out to get to fucking get girls but it turns out just guys asking get you what your the birds. Are. <laughs> but uh it is you get more attention from guys this is true this is true that's hella funny uh, too many stories like that i know um but yeah so i worked with aaron and um like i said just really committed to it practiced uh we did what we could as far as the dieting goes coming into a show two weeks out two weeks out yeah yeah so even like the carb depletion doing the cardio just to get that any bit of fat that I had off, even though I was pretty lean at the time, I wouldn't do it if I didn't look, right. you know, semi good. So this was uh, the Fresno Classic, is what it's called. Shout out Fresno, my family <laughs> out there. Same. So this was uh, 2011 Fresno Classic. I believe it was in March. Um, went down there with Steve. We did it. Long story short, there was only two classes. Which, if you know men's physique now, it goes by letters by height. So they do it by height in the NPC. And so you have A, B, C, D, so on and so forth, depending on your height. And it depends on how many competitors are competing. They're going to create more of those classes, depending if there's more competitors. Five, seven kings here. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I was a class A, always the first one. No, yep. but once I got bigger, like maybe I moved up to class B. But yeah. um, for the most part, so that one, again, was only two. It was A and B. That's it, which is like unheard of now. And there was only... <laughs> Three competitors in uh, my class in A, and I think there was five in B. So my friend Steve was in B. I was in A. Okay. I won my class, which when you win your class, you uh, compete against the winners from all the other classes in what's called the overall. And that's throughout the state or what? That's just how the NPC works. That's for every, that, but it was a, that's how district and national level shows. All okay, the NPC so when, works like so that. So when you win in your class, yeah, you so class A winner goes up against class B winner. Oh, that's class what you mean. C, okay, class okay, D. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. the winners from each class. And then, and then, because there's a one through fifth place, or however that's many right. they want for that's each right. A, B, C, D. It's and not then, just for all. And then at the end, end, you guys, those winners of each class goes for the overall. For the overall, okay. yeah. And so, unfortunately, my friend Steve got second in the B class, and so I I went up against the um, the guy who beat him because he got second uh for the overall and i had to beat that guy yeah to get to avenge my friend <laughs> <laughs> shit yeah so it's a good dog right there i do what i could you know you exude that confidence to the judges and just do the best you can and i won the overall good shit so dude. i did it two um, weeks out <laughs> two week prep yeah given there's only eight competitors compared yeah. to now there's hundreds but yeah yeah Anyways, so yeah, so I won. I came out with two trophies. You're, you're euphoric. Um, yeah, for sure. You're like amped. Yeah. That two weeks was probably, you. I imagine you were already like in, you were obviously already in solid shape. So mm-hmm. you didn't have to like diet crazy or anything right. like that. So that was probably nice. It was funny backstage too, because most of the competitors were bodybuilders back there. Back there. Uh, yeah. And uh, he, and they were like, what is this? Like, they didn't even know about they men's physique. They didn't get men's physique, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we got a lot of heat at the beginning for it uh, get from the bodybuilders. But then some of them were even like, well, if I knew about that one, I would have probably done that one. Yeah. You know, because it's more the smaller end of bodybuilders. Mm-hmm. 
who didn't have the legs or something like that because right. we mostly get judged on upper body since we're wearing board shorts. Yeah. We still work out our legs. Yes, uh, mostly, sometimes. Yes. At least me. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> so from there, I continue working with Aaron and obviously I had to see where I can take it. It wasn't, I didn't have a solid goal in mind other than which, and I try to pass this on to other competitors or potential competitors as well, is that, you know, just go in doing your best right. like see what's the best you can do like don't go in expecting to win i was just gonna say don't that. go in expecting to turn pro like i hear that all the time we had this and conversation like, not... we had a conversation about this a couple weeks ago did you with uh with you oh we did yeah in the <laughs> kitchen <laughs> okay. well, we're, well, we're yes that's true we were now revising our episode my one of my episodes with a guest that i had and uh i was telling you about uh, a couple of girls that i know right who've um gone right into working out and then immediately got into competing mm -hmm. doesn't make sense dude right i mean you can you can have the dream there's nothing wrong with having the dream of yeah. wanting to get on stage and yeah. doing all this stuff but there's a it's a process right you know like it's a especially it, if you expect to do well right and it's there's like there's no rush there really is all the time it's always gonna be there it's and not like, going anywhere. <laughs> we're like not, I mean, especially because at the time we were obviously younger, like they're my age, mm -hmm. but at the time we're like 19, 20. And it's like, we have so, so many years to come where we'll be, we'll be super well conditioned at that point, And then you can really, you know, then you'll know for a fact if you're like five years in, yeah. if that's something you're interested in, then just do it. And then you'll know that you can, you, you're capable of um, sticking with something like that, that kind of goal. Oh yeah, for sure. And then they 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 go through with the the contest. Yeah, and they don't place well. Right. Not surprisingly. Yeah. And then that's it for them. Then yeah. they quit for a while. They like uh, Alexa said. Uh, they they develop a bad habit or a bad habit of eating. A relationship with food. Exactly. Yeah. For and, like, sure. That all just spirals, and you know, people fall out of it, and then they find their way back. Right. Um, I'm not, I'm not speaking just for the people that I know, but I would imagine it's like that with a lot of people who dive into competing way too soon. Oh yeah, definitely. And it's like, you have so much going on when you're young Yeah. and all your friends aren't into that. And like, they're not, yeah. And your friends don't get it. No. They make fun of you at first. And you, like you're, when you're that age, you're, you're partying all the time. Like on the weekends, you guys are going to parties and I'm stuff like, you don't want to miss, <laughs> you don't want to miss out on that. Like when yeah. you're young. So that's yeah, why I say, yeah. you know, just take your time, like go party, right. go have fun, you know, go through that stage in your life. Yeah. And then... You know, that's why I say the best time to do it is after that, right. like when you're 22, 23 at least. And also, the longer you wait, the better your body's going to look. Exactly. Your body's going to mature more. And if you happen to do stay consistent, even through the partying and stuff, you're at a better place to start. Yeah. Um, you're going to have some muscle and that sort of thing. I mean, so, you, uh, I was going to bring into a part of the story that you're probably going to mention later mm -hmm. um when you went to like edc and you were on a prep and you just stuck with your prep the entire time oh yeah well i'll get to that right now yeah, because okay. i where was i so i uh so between, you, you continue fresno a month later i continue with aaron yeah and the next show was a national qualifying show which was the san jose championships mm -hmm. um like i said i think it was a month later this would have been let's see well that was march uh april may this one was yeah probably may um, and so I did the San Jose again, long story short, I won my class and won the overall. Okay. Good so shit. again, uh, first place. Congrats. <laughs> thank you. First place, <laughs> everything. Yeah. So then that got me nationally qualified and between then and the next show, which was about, I'll just say a month after that in July, well, this is June, July, it might've been in June mm. at that time was the USA's and that was a oh, national wow. show. So USA yeah. is in, in Vegas. Yeah. But I already had EDC in 2011 planned, which is the first year is in Vegas because mm -hmm. it used to be in LA. Uh, with my group of friends, I had a, a two bedroom suite booked at the Palms Place already. Damn. Yeah. So I had a, but I was in prep yeah. and I was 100% committed. And so I had a limo pick us up from the airport, go straight to Costco. Yep. With all my friends. That's the move. Got what I needed because I made sure that the, Sweet had a full kitchen. Right. Um, got everything I needed for my food for the weekend and got to the room and cooked everything up, put on Ziploc bags. And the whole weekend, I didn't drink. I didn't do any drugs. I stayed sober and I still had a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. And dude. I did my cardio still, even though I don't know how much it was needed because uh, you're up all night dancing. Yeah, right. 
Um, <laughs> Fuck. But I still remember going to the hotel gym. I think I have pictures from then too, just taking them from the hotel gym when I was doing it, and uh, staying on my meal plan and staying on my workout schedule that is and program commitment during dude. EDC. Yeah, that's and that's what insane. it takes. Like, yeah. and that's what a lot of people don't realize. Like, are you willing to sacrifice that much, right. especially when you're younger? Yeah. And all your friends are doing this and that. For sure. And that's where I've had that stage. You know, at that time, I was, I can't remember how old I was, 25, I think, 24, 25. So I already went through all that, been there, done that. And so this was just like bonus. Like going to EDC was bonus to the competing. Yeah. And so I came back from uh, EDC to my coach and he's like, wow, I'm impressed. Yeah. You stuck to the program. Like I didn't think you were, to be honest. Did you train while you were up there? In Vegas? In Vegas, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Went to the gym and everything. Nice. So then we went back to Vegas for the competition. Um, it was me, my buddy Brad, and my coach, mm-hmm. Aaron. Um, and uh, there was over 500 competitors, Fuck. which was a lot more, not just in physique overall. Yeah. There's a lot more now. It's like double oh, that yeah, at dude, least. Now it's super flustered. But still, that is still a lot of people compared to the shows that I've been doing. Right. And so you, I was kind of thrown into the scene. So I got there to check-ins the day before on Friday. Competitions are always on Saturday. Unless it's a big show, then it's Friday and Saturday. And um, people were getting interviewed, and um, you see these guys who aren't covered up, you know, they're wearing their tank tops or whatever, and you can't help but look and compare. Get in your head. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you got to try not to do. Right. And that's what I feel like I was good at too, was just staying in the zone. Right. Staying yourself, staying confident in yourself. Don't worry about those other guys. You know, you don't know as good as you think they look. You don't know if they practice their posing to the best ability or as much as you. So you have to go in there with that confidence, knowing that you posed 110%, you died at 110%. If if you did that, then you keep that confidence. Yeah. And don't let that get in your head. And so I did. And um, and even backstage, I didn't really talk to anybody. Like all the other guys were kind of talking to each other, goofing around. I think it was more looking back at it. They were nervous and they were just kind of relating on that nervousness they're probably just trying to distract their own thoughts yeah 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 or intimidate each other or whatever whereas i would just had my hood on had a hoodie on stayed covered up yeah just focused went through my posing in my head in front of the mirror back there pumped up did everything you know aaron told me to do to the t yeah um and did i can't remember how many were in my class at that show like i said it was a lot more um i won my class which then I competed with overall. I didn't win the overall, um, but I won my class, which if you take first in your class, you turn pro. Oh, shit. So I turned pro in that show. Damn, dude. So that was my third. I turned pro in three shows, which is really unheard of now. Damn. Um, got my pro card. The next Fuck, day, dude. had a photo shoot with all the winners. Yeah. Um, I turned pro with, I don't know, people who fitness or follow fitness probably know who Narman is. I think I've Narman heard of Asari. That name. Um, she turned pro at that show as well. Uh, I can't remember anybody else who's still competed, competing who turned pro at that show besides Steve Kuklo, the bodybuilder. He competes in Olympia. He turned pro in that show as well. Okay. So this was the 2011 USAs. Damn. Uh, Wendy Fortino, who is a uh, figure competitor. Do you keep up with these people still? On Instagram. Yeah. Not really talk to them. Right, right, right. Um, Wendy Fortino kind of interact with a little bit, but not... Yeah, her and Matt are great people. If you guys need any coaching for um, Matt, who? Uh, I'm blanking out on his last name right now, but you just know Wendy and Matt. That's uh, I'll have to. One thing I want to point out about um, you saying the best time to compete is when you have your party days, all that stuff behind you. In a in a sense, but also, I think what's also really important at the time that you did it was your mid twenties. I feel like. You have a lot of um, there's a lot of mental development that comes at that age, yes, and definitely. a lot of self reflect. And I mean, I would say for most people, obviously, some people care a lot about what others think about them physically or just whatever. Oh, especially um, when you're young. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is why I think that it's it's also really important. Now, I can't speak for what I, I've never competed, but I would imagine. Um, competing at a younger age when you're really like just like oh i'm better than that guy or mm-hmm. oh fuck I, that guy's that guy's and you can't are better help than it. mine yeah it's like science and it's it's uh, for biology. sure exactly it's, like you got testosterone we're always through your veins yeah exactly we're <laughs> always gonna we're always gonna compare but 
some people can really suppress that like you did. Mm -hmm. And I mean, shit, I don't know if I'd be able to do it as well as you did. Right. But I'm pretty now I'm pretty grounded as far as not like really comparing myself to other guys or whatever. Like I am what I am and they are what they are. Right. Maybe I can do something about it, but it's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, but that's, you can do what's in your control. Exactly. Yeah. And I think for people, I mean, if you're still listening to this, which that I fucking <laughs> hope you are, but if for yeah, people, sorry we're going so long on the fitness thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can switch gears soon. Um, but for most people who have the desire to compete, definitely just like evaluate yourself first. Not even Definitely. in terms of whether yes. or not you can stay consistent with the process of just lifting and dieting, but when it comes to the day, how do you think you're going to react when you're going to see guys that are just up to par with you? Yeah, it's so much harder. Yeah. Because a lot of guys will see themselves in the gym and think they're hot shit, like at their gym. Yeah. Who, all those guys in their gym aren't usually aren't competing. And then, so you got all these guys in a competition coming together who are all the best looking at their gym. Yeah. Yeah, and so you just have to have the confidence when you're standing next to them on stage that you did everything you could. Yeah, don't you don't need to compare yourself, no, you know, yeah. to others. You don't need to compare yourself as much as you think that other guy might look better than you. Fuck it. I mean, he, 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 if anything, you he, guys, he might not pose as well as the, you. He might not show his physique as well as you. If you exude that confidence, yeah, even with him looking better, you can still beat him. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it's you just not have to even make about that connection with the judges, and, and it's so subjective with yeah, the judges. Exactly. I was just gonna say, you make that connection even, with them. It doesn't even matter if he has a better fucking physique. It's if he can, pre if he can, uh, um, what's the word? Ex I say exude. Exude. You exude that yeah, confidence. On stage. You show your yeah. yeah, and you can present it well present on stage. It, yeah, yeah. And your, um, you know, the craft of being able to pose in whatever way you do. Yeah, because these judges don't see you in the gym working out. All the time. But then they also like don't... two hours a day, this and that, and they, they don't see you posing, flexing. All they get to see you is for less than 10 seconds. Yeah, but also what's, posing. what people I feel like probably don't even know is they don't judge you. I mean, I'm sure they judge you based off of how you look, but they judge you based off of like the fluidity of your stage performance and how you transition from pose to pose. Right. Your physique is some of it, but that's the other yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people don't even know that. Right, think, that's that can be more important. Exactly. That's what I tell my posing clients. You think we can work out? And this look, is gonna look make good. or break you, dude. Yeah, you know, it's that, how you present shit. it. You can have the fucking the best body in the world, <laughs> and if you can't show it right, then I mean, this then is just, you don't have it exactly. <laughs> if you aren't showing your, I'm talking like I've I've won my IFBB Pro Cut. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I know I you I won know. it with me. <laughs> yeah, no, but I know just after hearing people talk about it, you know, mm -hmm. like some guys, like Christian Guzman, like he. I don't even think he has his, he doesn't have his pro card, but no, he, I, I know that from his summer shredding videos or um, his summer shredding series that he's done, he's been doing, mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of it, he was saying like, just what I just said, mm -hmm. like, if you can't present it right, you're not going to, you're not going to win. Yeah. Because if you don't know how to pose your back and display your back to the best ability, then to the judges, you don't have a back. You have yeah. a weak back. Yeah, exactly. You know what, something's weak if you don't know how to pose it. But anyway, so yeah, Turn Pro did the photo shoot. I was in, it's funny, they featured the USA winners in Flex Magazine um, two months, I think, in a row. Mm -hmm. So I was in both of those. Just your, just my picture from on stage. Yeah. They presented all the winners from the USA's. I think I have that magazine somewhere. Damn. So it's kind of cool. Sure and a nationally do. published magazine, yeah. You have fucking everything from, dude, you, what, what's funny about Frank is, He'll tell me about something, and then he'll go on his phone and pull up a picture from like 2006. I don't know oh, how you yeah. have all That's these. That's what's nice about the digital age. Yeah, I don't know. What's, <laughs> I don't know how you have all those the photos memories on your phone. Like, you oh, know, I run know. out of storage. No, <laughs> That's no, insane, yeah. Dude. Since I think my first iPhone. God damn. I just keep it going. That's hilarious. I have it. I'll just transfer it. Just keep transferring it because it makes it so easy now. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, so when Flex you won, magazine, yeah. So when you won, um, that was the only time. That was it. The last time you competed? No. So that was in June or July, whenever the USA's was in 2011. There was no pro shows that year. That was the first year physique, so they needed to create the pros. And then 2012 was the first year there was uh, pro shows okay. for physique. And so the first ever men's physique pro show was in Sacramento, uh, Governor's Cup. I think that was March, 2012, and I decided to do that one. Um, so me and Aaron, after I turned pro, we, uh, 
don't know if you want to get into supplementation, but I kind of do. Okay, so not well, we can like that we tap into it right because we've covered fitness a lot. Yeah, but let's let's try to just <laughs> keep it brief. Um, so after the USA's, uh, we realized you know once you get to a certain level, so from district level to national level to pro level, you notice the quality of physiques on stage. Mm-hmm. You know more muscle, right? Bigger. Um, so the bottom line is you pretty much, you have to take steroids. Yeah. If you're competing at a certain level, you have to come to that realization. Are you comfortable with, with that or not? Yeah. If you're not, and you plan on doing well in national level or pro level, you can, you can try, but most likely everybody Everyone, else is yeah. on it. So you're at a disadvantage yeah. in that sense. Or and it's, it's not it, cheating I, at all. It's, I feel like it's, it's, uh, obviously that's how the industry is. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want to succeed or get farther, you have to be on something. And I feel like for the people who try to remain natural for that entire process, yeah. they're kind of setting their their uh, their mental state for um, failure in a yeah. way because you're going to try and go up with all these guys that are double your size when you train just as hard of them maybe as them maybe, yeah. but you're not going to win. Right. And then it just it's going to just be like why the fuck am I not winning? Like yeah. shit like that. That's just part of the sport now. Yeah. That's just a fact of the matter. Like that's just how it is. So I got comfortable with it. I trusted my coach and, and yeah, he's very knowledgeable in it. You know, I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Right. I, I looked up, his, he encourages you to look it up yourself. Like know what you're putting in your body, no matter what it is. Yeah. Like even if it's just vitamins or whatever. Um, so we got on supplementation and um i call it supplementation i don't know it's a nice way to it. suppress steroids yeah yeah and um i gained 10 pounds of muscle from the time i turned pro to me stepping on stage at the governor's cup the pro show so it's and you see the difference in the pictures for like sure. what nine to ten months uh yes yeah yeah so i was proud of the physique i brought there but um but yeah so i competed in that i didn't place there's 10 of us uh again the first pros were all used to winning and uh didn't win and from there i just kind of reflected not winning didn't make me stop competing yeah i just want to clarify that yeah yeah it was it was more i was in a place at that time where i wasn't financially stable like competing is super expensive Expensive, yeah that's the other thing you want to do not only are you mentally ready to compete but are you financially ready because you don't want to have to stress on finances while you're trying to compete yeah you don't i mean you're already low calorie your yes. body's sore <laughs> and then the next thing you know you're you got to reduce problems. as much stress as you can going into competition because you are going to have some stress yeah and stress the cortisol can affect your physique in a matter of hours so yeah. you want to yeah try to eliminate that as much as possible and i feel like i'm good at managing stress yeah. and so that's what also helped me out but so yeah so that's when the last time i competed was 2012 mm-hmm. Damn. um so just for people that you know, everyone has their own thoughts and misconceptions about steroids. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people think that that's cheating, and you said that it's not, and I know that it's not, but for mm-hmm. people who think that and who are closed mind, it, whoever listens to my podcast, I hope that they listen with an open mind right. based off of whatever I talk about. I yeah. mean, most of the time it's just me talking about fart jokes and shit <laughs> like that, but, you know, for something like this, obviously... Um, it's kind of a serious thing like steroids and shit like that in the gym and why it's important for specifically competing. Cause I right. feel like if you're not competing, then, then may, then at that point it's like, okay, well, you know, whatever. Yeah. And there's a lot of stereotypes. Exactly. So yeah. what are, what do you think about steroids are a couple of misconceptions that people have because everyone says, Oh, he's on steroids. He's cheating. Or that means that he's going to beat up his girlfriend. Roid or rage. Roid rage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, I, my understanding of it and my personal experience of being on it is that it just intensifies whatever is already there in you. Yeah. So in general, and where I think the roid rage comes from is guys are higher in testosterone anyways. And so you're just amplifying that you're adding more steroids is testosterone. So you're amplifying your testosterone in your system and that is going to make you more aggressive. Usually. For the most part. And if so, if you already have an aggression problem without it, just imagine it being amplified. Yeah, exactly. If you don't have a problem with aggression before it, then you might get little, you might 
see it a little bit, yeah. but it's not going to be to the point where you're going to have roid rage. That more stems from, like I said, most guys already being aggressive and then it just being amplified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, that's how I broke it down for some people that I like yeah. some of my friends when I was like, cause you just got to educate yourself in right. it and then you'll understand it more, but yeah. they're not going to take the time to do that usually. I mean, there have been Most times people. where I debated on doing some shit like that. It was really after I started going to 24 San Carlos because, I, I mean, a lot of people there are on something. Or right. at least they were when I first switched over to that gym. Yeah. And I was, I mean, I never really got to the point where I, like, got the shit. But I was like, I was like, well, you know, I I mean, once I switched to 24, that was a game changer for me. Like, that's when I my training really took off. Mm-hmm. And I started to get super into it. I really wanted to, like, start getting these numbers up and, like, as far as like my strength and then like my then see when I first started working out there I was only worried about strength so that's when I got like really big like right. chubby big and like thick and then once that built up to whatever point it did I was like okay now I want to now I want to look jacked and right. cut and like do yeah. all this shit and there's a difference there yeah exactly and looking big yeah and I, being strong and I was like I was thinking about you know if I did this you know, then what's going to happen? I, I'm, you're worried at mm-hmm. first and you don't really know what to expect. And then, um, I started looking into it and at the, just before I switched over to 24, I went to, um, I was in a kinesiology class at mm-hmm. Kenyatta and we did like a breakdown of, you know, the misconceptions and like what people think versus what can actually come. But the main thing that was told was what you said was it's already going to amplify what's there, like a pre existing, you know, um, trait that you might have or whatever yeah i feel like if you're outgoing you're gonna be more outgoing yeah you know <laughs> so you know like there's just so many things where people are like they're cheating and it, that's not that's how the industry is like everybody's on it like mm-hmm. that's just how it is right. and um if you want to win that's kind of the you, and then also about the point of it being cheating sorry to interrupt is that it's not you know it doesn't <laughs> it's not gonna automatically give you muscles right like yeah. you're not gonna take it Train, and get jacked right away. You got to train harder than the average person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not even the same. Like some people think, okay, if one person, if two people are training the same, one person's on um, steroids, the other's not. If they train at a low level, that doesn't mean that the guy's going to get super jacked that's on. Yeah. You know, when you're on, you still have to train as hard, if not harder. And it's going to help you train harder too. Right. Because that testosterone is going to, you recover faster. That's why you get bigger muscles right. <laughs> and you're stronger. And so the intensity level goes up. Yeah. So you, you, you are literally usually training harder mm-hmm. when you're on. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't say we're condoning. Mm-mm. I think we're just saying, you know, it's yeah, there. Not. It's always going to be there. Right. And just educate yourself. Yeah. Make sure, you know, especially if like you got a coach or whatever, don't always take their word for it. Nope. You know, you got to do your own research. Definitely. Um, and just be smart about what you do and then wait a little bit before you decide to compete, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think we can, we could probably end that fitness talk right there. Yeah. Uh, unless I think you have so. anything else to say? You know, Piece of I, just the, I mean, it's funny that I used to get people and you probably got it too. If you're out somewhere and they see that you have muscle and they're like, how much do you bench? Yeah. I always laughed at that question. It's so funny because it's like, you can tell them anything. Yeah, like I bench six hundred pounds. <laughs> like video or didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, what am I gonna prove it to you right here? Yeah. at the restaurant, the just, bar, let me whatever. Just bench like, press this fucking club? taxi right here. Yeah, like come on, like that's a stupid question to ask. Yeah. and it's like, as long do I look like I can bench six hundred pounds? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's all that Dope. matters. Yeah. That's why I'm into bodybuilding versus like strength training. Right, it was right, cool right. to get strong and up your PRs, but I'm more about the looks. Yeah, and I can achieve this look. You still are strong. Yeah. But it's also better for your joints and stuff like that if you're not going as heavy, you yeah. know, for longevity's sake. You yeah, know, I'm just doing it more for the aesthetic. For sure. And there's a difference, you know. Because when I was when I was doing strength training, dude, my body was fucked up. Oh yeah. My it, knees were jacked up. My elbows joints, were fucked. Yeah. My neck was always hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but isn't that funny though? <laughs> we can end this right after this. But like, you know, I started working out to impress girls, right? You know, that's where it always starts for guys. I feel like the majority, <laughs> I would say probably about 80% that's of guys. That's what's on your mind. Exactly. Guy, like <laughs> Especially if you start working out at an, like, you know, late teens, early 20s, you mm-hmm. start working out and you're like, all right, sick, I'm going to get all the chicks. And then all you got is just a bunch of dudes asking what your PRs are. It's like, all yeah. right, dude. 
You got the is, dudes looking at you. This more is than not the girls. what I signed up or put the hard work in yeah, for. Yeah, admiring your physique. Yeah, like, they'll come up to you and yeah, say, dude. "Dang, you have a great chest day." Eh? And then it's great arms. Someone compliments you. It's another guy compliments you, and you're like, "Oh, I'm trying to look like you, though, man." Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's that circle. It's, it's all over. No, 24 you. Hours. No, is. you. <laughs> and it's like, all right, I'm leaving now. So earlier, we were um, when we were in the beginning of your your fitness journey story. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you went to. What was it? The Academy of Arts? Academy of Art University in San so Francisco. Mm-hmm. Did you, um, I'm just trying to think really quick. Did you already, did you plan to go there like always or did you have a desire to go like a four year at all or? Um, well, it is a four year. It's a private school, but you're talking about just like I mean, a like, UC. Yeah, or like a state school or, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Whatever. I mean, I looked into those two. Mm-hmm. I did my research. Um, at that time, I was just super into design, obviously. Um, going there and I was looking at again specifically car design okay is yeah, what I right. wanted to get into mm-hmm. and like car design and stuff like that what's that you wanted to work for like a company where you could do like renderings yeah for new, that's part new, of it yeah new models yes concept cars and yeah. all that that's the dream is yeah you work for a manufacturer a car manufacturer there's independent design shops stuff like that but yeah it was just designing cars was the dream and that's under transportation design which is under industrial design okay is the parent of it. And so I looked up schools for car design, transportation design. And um, that one came up, our institute in San Francisco. The Probably the most renowned is the one in SoCal. It's um, the Art Center. I think it's just Art Center. Where's that one in Art LA? Uh, what's the town that starts with a P down there? Pe- I want to say Petaluma, but that's up here. Yeah. P. Yeah, the it's Rose Bowl's there, Pasadena. Pasadena, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Pasadena. That's still, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, about SoCal, LA. we'll just say yeah. SoCal, yeah. yeah. Um, and I couldn't afford to go there. Uh, I mean, Academy of Art was pretty expensive itself. Uh, still paying for that one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I decided to go to Academy of Art University. I could commute to it uh, from my house. It was a two-hour commute each way. So that took a lot of commitment. Yeah. My instructors How at school the were week? like, yeah, five days a week, every day. Oh, Sometimes on the weekends, I would go too. Damn. So I was living on, I would drive to, so if I had an 8, 8.30 class, I would have to leave my house by like 5 a.m. Um, so I lived in the Valley. I went to junior high and high school in Manteca. And uh, the BART started in Pleasanton. And so I would have to drive to Pleasanton and then take BART into the city. Okay. So in total, it was two hours. And so okay. I lived on BART that whole time. That but at least sucks. my instructors, yeah, that when they'd hear that, they're like, oh, wow, you are super committed. And that's how I've always been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you tell with competing and right, stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I studied industrial design there, which first you start with the basics. And what you're trying to do that whole time is trying to get what's in your head onto paper. Mm-hmm. That's super hard to do for most people is translating that vision. I would materializing imagine. it yeah and somehow whether it's on the computer or you're sketching it out that takes a lot of practice and skill so did you, we uh, did shapes and then you did uh products and then you can and then you start to get into cars and that's where i was as i started getting into cars how soon if uh so you pretty much off the bat you already had some kind of like artistic vision in a sense mm-hmm. so did would you say that there were people in that class like kind of already up to your caliber or were you kind of more of like, yeah, the it was a wide spectrum because okay. you didn't really, you didn't need to apply yeah. to get into the program. They pretty much just accepted Anyone? anybody. Yeah. yeah. So there was a wide range. Okay. There's people who weren't as good and there's people who were like amazing mm-hmm. already um, at the level that I was. At so school. how soon did you get into the car design after you started? Is that like a, that was like three years, two, oh, okay. three years, but I, I started to get, go off and on with classes um i started lightening up my semesters as far as class load yeah and because it was super intense right like i said like i pull all-nighters and and that sort of thing so and then i started coming to the realization that even if i proceeded with the program and i spent all this money and what would be the outcome and i learned while there that there's hardly any jobs in car design the pretty much how it was put was that somebody has to die for a spot to open up. Fuck. Uh, Yeah. Damn. It's really sought after. For For as many people who apply to the program at my school, at least I know, I think it was about 500 people would start 
the transportation design program at Academy of Art University, and how many would graduate would be less than 10. No fucking way. Yeah. So Damn. I'm one of those statistics. I did not finish. You didn't graduate, yeah. No. Yeah. But I took what I learned. I learned a lot. Right. Um, I learned digital programs, uh, the basics of color and design, um, ergonomics. And that's all, that's all uh, like pretty much essentially gra- graphic design? Uh, starting to get into because there is specific graphic design programs, okay. and I was doing industrial design, not graphic design, but they did. There was some crossover. Okay. Because when you lay out your industrial designs, you would want to lay them out in a graphical manner. So, what's a an easy way to describe industrial design versus graphic design? Like where? Yeah. So, industrial design is product design. Essentially, is what you can sum it up as. So, anything that you see, like this microphone, this uh, microphone holder, this table. This uh, sign box mm-hmm. here, it was designed by an industrial designer. Okay, the got it. Computers. Graphic design is more so just stuff that's on screen. Is that the difference? You mean what I do now? Well, just UI UX is is like just, digital products. Okay. But this is physical digital products. products. Okay. Industrial design. That's another okay, way to put okay, it. Okay. Hardware or physical products is industrial design. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I didn't. I didn't really because know the now difference. there's digital products and there's hardware. So right. what I design now is digital products. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you just said that you you didn't um, you didn't finish the school and you took what you learned. Out and of I the started years doing graphic there. designing. Okay, you started doing graphic design. Yeah. And then just before the podcast, we were talking about um, different routes that people take when it comes to trying to look for a job. Uh, more of like a mainstream big company like a whatever Facebook or anything like that Mm -hmm. versus going to a smaller startup and having the ability so like you were saying when you want to just say how what when you go with a big company you're kind of you're kind of put on like a one path that you have a specific role like amount of guidelines yeah whereas you go to a startup you kind of you take on multiple roles right that's a good way of putting it so in a startup since you're running lean, meaning that there's not that many people in the company, it's a, if it's a lean or small startup, is that everybody who is there is taking on multiple roles just because you don't have as many people to specialize in a particular certain role. Like yeah. when you do, as the company grows, you start to develop those departments. Right. And then you get those people who can focus on specific roles. That's the nice people part about it. People are designated a to certain, you know, categories. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of the difference. And so do you want to go to, when you're first starting out, do you, like, say you want to be a, um, what's called a product designer in the digital realm, is a digital product designer. So an app mm-hmm. is a digital product. So you want to be an app designer, we'll yeah. just say. And so do you want to go into an established company as a, like, junior app designer, a junior product designer, and learn from there? You know, under, what the advantage of there is that, you can focus on one thing and you are learning from other people who are experienced in that field. So you have a lot of resources around you while you're working there. Yeah. If it's a good culture. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cause I feel like most, most, uh, not that I know, but I just feel like the kind of people that work in like a, um, a techie kind of company mm-hmm. all pretty like they're just well kept with themselves and mm-hmm. they just want to do their work. More so with developers. Okay, is a stereotype with that. Okay, developers are more to themselves, um, because they kind of don't need to be that collaborative. Like there's advantages of being collaborative as a developer, especially cross departments with like a designer. Yeah, but as a designer, you have to be, or it's ideal for you to be collaborative yeah. with other designers to get more ideas. I mean, like not that. even other designers, but all the other departments. Like marketing and and dev, dev too, because you need to get familiar with how they're developing it, and you want to get familiar with the stakeholders and the marketing department because how they want to present the product. Yeah, and so you're finding out that research that they have. I mean, you're doing your own research as a designer, as a product designer. What's called in UX is uh, UX research, where you're finding out about the, your users, but you also can get that from the marketing department. Like who are our ideal users? Yeah, and you're designing for them, and so like I said, it takes a lot of collaboration, and more minds is better than one. And you're seeing because you're seeing things from different perspectives. So you got this designer. If you're working with multiple designers, this designer came from a different background than you, most likely, and they see things a little bit differently from another perspective. And you bring that together, and that makes the product typically better. Yeah, 
Yeah. It almost seems like tricky in a way because that's I feel like that's such a that's such a fork in the road of a decision to make whether mm. or not you want to go to a, an established company or you want to go to a startup. At the startup, you have the advantage of kind of being a little bit more free mm-hmm. and you can take on certain things and like uh, develop your skills more in yeah. different avenues. But then at the same time, if you want to do all that, you either have to one already know it or to learn it all. Right. Whereas if you go to like a well-established <laughs> company, then you, like you said, if it's a, if it's a friendly environment, you know, people are willing to share their ideas or teach you, willing to teach you. Right. Then that's, that's, I would almost want to go that route, but mm-hmm. that's a gamble because I feel like, you know, well, that's actually probably the safer route. Yeah. Going the startup route, the way that I did it was the startup route. So I didn't work for a company first and learn everything is that, going into a startup and taking on those multiple roles, it forces you, like you said, you got to learn, you got to learn it pretty much on your own. Yeah. And you know, you have to be resourceful. For definitely. Sure. You have to be self-management, self-managing and um, resourceful. So you have to look it up, uh, you know, take online classes, whatever you need to do, look up resources. That's what I did. Uh, and I learned things quickly and it just clicked, yeah. you know, and it worked out for me. Um, and that's what, and that's the gamble because you're working for usually low income too. Whereas if you work for a bigger company, you have a stable salary. Yeah. Uh, startups iffy. <laughs> right, right. Right. Usually they pay you less, Yeah, but you're doing more work. But then the payoff is that you are, if that company becomes successful, you're in a better position. Oh yeah. You're like you, your employee. That you know, almost, 10, I feel like that almost rather than employee to a couple thousand, 200,000. Yeah. Or whatever, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's almost i mean that that would be a fucking crazy jump too because say the company did blow up and it's like okay you're getting paid this much you oh, get acquired and yeah. then you get acquired yeah and then like, you get acquired and then it's like oh shit like night and day difference yeah. when it comes to like pay and like um, you got your equity in the position. company yeah. being that early and that sort of thing but most startups don't succeed yeah most startups fail right and again that's where the risk comes in so but, you went the startup route. Yeah, so graphic designing, I was doing freelancing. You said how I got into. You want to go into like how? Yeah, I'm just curious to know like because uh, uh, we could talk about this now if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, you have your own companies. Right. That you've created or co-created, however you want to say it. Yeah, co-founded. Co-founded, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but really quick, when you first got into the startup world, you worked for different companies. I was actually working retail for a steady paycheck. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was working retail. Okay. I worked retail for like 10 years. Um, and while I was working retail, I was doing graphic designing on the side, freelancing. Yeah. Just like making business cards, logos for people, menus for restaurants, you know, just odd, just whatever, so uh, you graphic designing. you didn't work for an actual startup company then? No. Okay. I didn't work for a company. I... I co-founded a company. That's the company I work for. So along that route, through a friend of a friend, I met somebody who was doing, I started becoming interested at that time, this thing called UI UX, which stands for user interface and user experience, started becoming a thing. And what that is, is it used to be just known as like uh, web design and app designing, but that started becoming specializing in UI UX. They started putting more focus on it in design of those products. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started becoming a thing. Like UI is designing the user interface. Okay. So how it looks. And Uh, we can leave this to websites or apps, but it's how the app looks. mm -hmm. Like what color the buttons were, um, what shape are the buttons, where they position, that sort of thing. Where the position kind of can go into UX, but UX is the user experience. So it's the layout of it. Right. So it goes UX then UI. So just to not get too technical, technical <laughs> for people to sure. tune out or whatever. Basically, you're saying. What do you mean? This is Silicon Valley. No, well, yeah, that's true. Where are you tuning in from? Are you, well, are we national you yet? Know, <laughs> you know, uh, my my listeners, the juicers. Yeah. They, uh, they, I don't know if they tune in or tune out very often. Right. Um, but basically, just to dumb it up for them. I know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, it's basically just like how the user perceives a website. Or, you know, you guys want to make it aesthetically pleasing as possible. That's the UI. Yeah, okay. Right. And then... But then the UX the is experience. how it's laid out, the experience. Right, right, okay. And that that's a lot more... Well, I would say more goes into it, but oh, there's a lot of steps. So, um, 
just to kind of not get too technical about it. Sure. As far as like the business aspect. Yeah. Because you have co-founded your own company mm -hmm. that you are obviously working on night and day for. Yeah. Um, what are, what made you one want to start your own thing? Mm -hmm. And two, what was that experience in the beginning? Let's kind of talk about, um, you know, the struggles and maybe the highlights or some parts of the founding of your company. Yeah. So, um, I was going to say the, so I have always been kind of entrepreneur minded. Yeah. That might stem from me wanting to be a car designer was ultimately, you know, okay, work for a company, design your own car. But then you start to get this vision of a car that's in your head that you want to produce. You don't really want to do it for anybody else. And so that's kind of, I think, where it might have stemmed from. But I, I became entrepreneur minded where I wanted to build my own company. Yeah. While I was working in retail, I had a couple coworkers um, at where I was working and we started a clothing company. And um, so we were all co-founders and uh, I was a creative director. So I was in charge of doing all the designs and everything, the logo and the website and uh, designing the apparel, like graphics on the apparel. Yeah. And so that's where I kind of gained a little bit experience of having my own company um, and the work that it took, even though we were doing it more for a hobby and more for a learning experience. Yeah. We weren't really focused on it making money or it being successful. You know, we we're just doing it more for ourselves. Yeah. You know, just because we had a vision in our heads and we wanted to make it reality. That was basically what we we're doing. And then we yeah. gained experience along the way. So I got to learn, um, you know, uh, apparel design and how to uh, do that process. Uh, get it printed on wholesale and then even get into cut and sew, which cut and sew means that you're producing your own clothing from scratch. Okay. Like you have a producer that's actually sewing. You pick the material, you come up with a template, and then they sew it together. You get samples and all that kind of like alpha elite right, right, in right. what they're doing. Yeah. But when you start off, you usually you just get wholesale material and you do that. Yeah. So that's kind of where it got into my head, I think. And I gained some experience doing that. And then when I met my current co-founder, one of them, uh, Gianni, um, he had this company that was doing optimizing uh SEO, search engine optimization, like for websites to get your website ranked higher. Okay. That's sort of thing on Google, which is called SEO. There's SEO and SEM. And um, he, it was him who comes from the marketing background. And then he had a developer to help optimize the websites so they rank higher. So you put in the code that you need to put in for it to rank higher. What they were missing was the designer to help improve the website's design. Yeah. So it worked better and it looked better. You know, so that would also play into it ranking higher as well, but also improving the overall experience of the website. And so he presented that to me and I saw his opportunity. So I was like, yeah, let's let's do it. So it was the three of us. Uh, we gained some clients. We gained some more uh, people to work with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we eventually um, dissolved that company and we started a new company with uh, new partners. Uh, so me, him. Amber and Rob and we started Origamas um, and that essentially cool name thank you <laughs> <laughs> so that is so Amber and I are leading that charge with Origamas and that is uh, so we say we're product and growth meet me leading the product side and her meeting the growth side um, I try to think if I can put it in it summarize what that means but what we do is we offer services for growing your business, whether it's through your website or digital product yeah. from an idea um, or yeah, just improving it. So it grows pretty much. And it just looks nicer, like websites and stuff like that. Right. And it comes designing. from a strategy standpoint. So she'll put together the strategy plan and then we'll execute on that. Okay. And so I'll help execute on that. So whether you have an, a brand new idea or you already have a business or existing, like say uh, juice box, you wanted to grow your audience or something like that. You would come to us and we would run the strategy and we'd figure out how to grow your audience. And so we huh. can do it to all different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No matter, for, almost for no anything. matter what it is. For anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Almost for anything. Uh, so it's pretty in the digital space. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty, I mean, you can do it in the physical space too, but pretty universal yeah. as Definitely. far as, um, what so we don't just design on. websites. Like a lot of people might think we don't just design apps. Yeah. It comes from, it stems from strategy, whether we get into the design part or not. Yeah. We we strategize how to grow whatever it is that you do. 
So when you were making, um, oh, but you went into like the struggles and that yeah, sort of yeah, thing. like what, yeah, like the, when, because <laughs> when you first got that first job, were you still working retail and like, were or were did you just no. quit and you were dependent on? Yeah, I was kind of between. Okay, so it happened at the right time. Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. I was writing the meet people, uh, right person at the right time. Yeah, and then meeting new people along the way during this process and just learning it quite quickly. And like I said, like this is when. I hate to use UIUX again, the the term. Yeah. But this is when it started becoming a real thing because now it's huge, especially in this area. Like everything's, especially in Silicon Valley. Especially here. Yeah. Um, I was gonna ask you something, but I forgot. But anyways, so you you gained this experience the experience from that first company, and then you guys branched off and created Origamis. Yep. Um, and now that's been two years for Origamis. I want to say I always forget if it's two or three. Yeah. Did you? You guys obviously had probably a couple of like battles here and there as far as uh, communication with coworkers oh, yeah. and Definitely. stuff like that. It's a growing process yeah. for sure. It always is. What are a couple of like, what would you say um, for people who are interested in maybe creating their own business um, when it comes to not necessarily dealing, but communicating with co-founders or even just employees? Um, like, yeah. you know, what, what are some things that you would have done differently along the way just to kind of lay out some um i don't know what i would have done differently but i just know that communication is key it's just like a relationship yeah you know a non-business relationship like any type of relationship it's checking your ego you know trying not to bring your ego into it too much and um just trying to be very understanding yeah that's where i feel like because my experience right now with the companies is that i like I have probably, I don't know, want to say opinionated, but I have strong um, personalities on both sides that I work with. Yeah. Right. So between co-founders and I'm like right in the middle and they know that. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. they come to me like as so a moderator type there. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can see things from both perspectives and that's what plays into, I feel like why I'm able to do what I do so well is because I can see things from different perspectives. Yeah. I have to put myself in other people's shoes to create and design these products that I do. Yep. And so just trying to see it from their perspective. It's like being open-minded or any other relationship that you're in. Try yeah. to see it from your partner's perspective, whether even if that's a romantic relationship or a business relationship. Yeah. If it, I mean, that rule alone applies to literally everything. <laughs> and people, yeah. I, you know, the one thing but that... But it's so easy to yes. let your emotions yes. get, the get best into it or too quick. So even if that happens, just take a breath try to take a step back and yeah yeah i mean i i can't even imagine like if i were because over the years i've gotten way better at like just being open-minded when it comes to listening to people yeah and like hearing what they have to say and like trying to learn why they think that way right and a couple years ago if i were to start my own company i would have been so one-sided and just like super close-minded and stuff like that so like to hearing people's ideas yeah. and stuff. I can't, I can't. Well, this, that. so for, for that example, so if you had somebody come to you with their idea, what you ha- instead of just taking it as what it is, like their idea, really ask yourself a why. Why, why, why do they have that idea? Oh, okay. You know, why are they presenting that idea? Like where do they think? Wh- to wh- themselves and why they maybe, if they're presented specifically to you, mm-hmm. you know, What's the key thing? And that's what we do too with any um, like feedback. Right. That we like user feedback that we get is what's the stem of that feedback? Like, is it just them just like reacting to something? Yeah. Or is there a real issue there? Like, that's so that, is that how you go about um, listening to feedback from your client? Like, you're yeah. saying your clients? Definitely. Have there been times? So, a lot of times I just try to listen. Yeah. So, I don't talk a lot. Right. You, you know, just let them get. I ask out. questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and then instead gotta... of me trying to say, "Oh, this is how it needs to be," I'll be like, "Okay, what if it was this way? Would it, you know?" And that's do you stuff, see it working? That's or not? all stuff that you probably acquire <laughs> throughout time. My experience, yeah. definitely, yeah, yeah. That's so how I am with my job too, because yeah. we obviously I got to talk to clients definitely. all the time. Oh and yeah, you got. I mean, sometimes it's <laughs> just like, no, 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 that's not gonna work when they just don't get right. it. Right. It's like, yeah. that's not going to work. It has to be this way. If you want to get your money's worth. Right. If not, we could do it your way, and then you'll end up spending more money. Yeah. You know? And the and the, the finesse, it depends on who you're dealing with, too. Because if they react negative to just telling them like that, and they just put a wall up, 
then you need to finesse it a little bit more yeah. and and present it a little bit differently. And that's what I've learned too. But did that answer your question about? It just, yeah. I mean, you know, like I, I was just curious about like struggles with having uh, co-founders because uh-huh. usually it's not usually, I mean, but you know, there a, lot, is. a lot of big companies, it's just oh. a single founder. Yeah. But um, I was just curious about, but there's, it's called founder fallout. Mm-hmm. It's just like a marriage and a divorce. Mm-hmm. It's just like that. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Right. And admittedly, like, I've wanted to quit yeah. many times. I'm that sure happens. That's, that's totally normal with people yeah. who start their own company. Right. With other And I'm people. leaning again to a relationship. It's yeah. the same thing. When it's you get into a fight. the same rules apply, yeah. Yeah. But so it's just taking the time to really think about, you know, why. Thinking it from their perspective. Why? How are they seeing it? Why are they seeing it this way? Yeah. You know, being humble in yourself. Like, being willing to admit that you're wrong maybe you know yeah like not that i've uh that takes a big person and yeah, like a for sure confident and satisfied person you know? yeah i i mean not that i've started my own company or anything but even with just like the podcast for instance mm-hmm. like if i ever thought of um you know doing a podcast with somebody else that's in a way it could turn into some kind of business thing like oh you know, definitely. i mean obviously all of my favorite podcasters they're all making money from their shit like that's a business yeah um, it's one of those things where like, if I were to go into some kind of business venture with somebody, I, I would need to know them for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I can kind of, I don't like to use the word judge, but I can judge somebody if I've known them for a while, I kind of know what their intentions are, you yeah. know, what their personality is when they're under stress yep. or, you know, just any, whatever. Um, that's always tricky with me because I feel like I don't know too many people where I would just like not. I mean, I don't have any business ideas, but like if I were to go in business, I can't think of like one person that I would really be able to rely on 110% to commit to doing something. So like that's another thing you got to look out for is if you really have a vision for a company or a brand that you want to start, I feel like it's really important to know who you're going into business with. For sure. Yeah. Because I mean like, you know. And then admittedly, I can tell that I didn't really do. Yeah, but but that's how you learn. learn, And then you kind of, you, you find like a middle ground Yeah, and you guys communicate same. Everything we're talking about is the same as a relationship, you know, Mm -hmm. like at first everything seems all nice and all smooth. Honeymoon phase. Exactly. And then like months in or year in, you start to see like the true, the true true personality (laughs) and like, you know, something, one thing that I, uh, that I would hate to see in really any kind of business aspect where there's co-founders is uh, just too much greed and like yeah. it's all money hungry. And I know you said you're not like the money isn't really everything that's there for you. Yeah. You it like doesn't to, excite me. Like it kind of does. And my, my partners know this too. Like I don't get excited about money yeah. until I see it in my bank. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can talk about all you want, like yeah. oh, this potential, this potential, this, but right. And I can see it, but it's like, yeah. Yeah. We, I gotta, I gotta see what well, you want to see. Like, you're also creating, like, in a sense, it's art. So you want to make sure that, you know, what you're putting out there is worth getting paid for. Yeah, and that can be hard at times, too, because you're never satisfied with it. It's, like, it's never good enough. And that's where there's a thing that there's a saying, too. It's, like, done is better than perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. in our world. And I keep reminding people, even my clients, too, it's, like, because they get stuck in it, too. Like, they have to make it perfect. They want to put in all these features, like it's going to make it more successful than putting all these features right. or it's going to make it better or this and that. But really it can end up hurting you. Yeah. Cause it's like, there's too much here. Yeah. They got like, I got 10 pounds of <laughs> shit in a five pound bag. Like it yeah. doesn't, you know, you, it's not always better. Exactly. More is not always better. Sometimes it, the phrase less is more honestly mm-hmm. goes a long way with anything. Yeah. And really. what, I, what I tell them too, is that you, it's a digital product. It's not a hardware product, which hardware is takes a lot more time and money to reiterate yeah and to add things to it but digital it's code mm-hmm. like you can add it on the fly yeah you can change it so easily and so for this version let's do it this way mm-hmm. let's get real user feedback so we're not just going off of assumptions right and then we can add it we can add it we can take it out we can change it whatever but yeah. let's just you know start with this but in uh in another avenue um the business is going well for now Yes, we are steady. We have steady clients. Um, we are, we still need to grow. So we're investing in our own company and ourselves, which is sometimes hard to do, right? When you get busy with client work, when do you have time to work on 
your own business right stuff so that's what we're working on Especially right now if you it's only have always, a couple people yes yeah <laughs> keeping it lean yeah and so it's like uh so we're trying to improve the website always improving the website um always creating content and what it is is like you're talking about like uh christian guzman and all the fitness people putting on putting out free content right there's free and there's paid content so it's all the free stuff and then when they offer their programs yeah. that's paid content mm-hmm. in other words or gated is what we use too and so we put out the free content which is usually in the form of articles which will promote us and our expertise in the fields that in our services that we offer. And then there's the, the paid stuff so or it's not the like, paid, but like our marketing. services you pay for. Right. And then there's some uh, gated stuff, which you have to put in your email maybe to access like a downloadable P- PDF okay. of something yeah, yeah. we created. Right. And so we're working on those pieces because then we get the email and then we can market to those emails. Mm-hmm. Um, and whenever we come out with new stuff and things like that, and then they become our clients. So yeah. it's that, it's that uh, lead generation is what it's called. So you're generating leads to your business. And that's what we're doing right now. So if anybody needs any. Yeah, dude, plug it. Anything. <laughs> you need I mean, some, we already uh, pretty much talked about it, but origamis.com. Yeah. It's Good like shit. origami. But Oro. Us. I said or a. Yeah. O-R-O-G-A-M-I-S.com. Yeah, dude. Good shit. So you can go to the website and if you still don't understand what it is, hopefully that helps. Yeah. Or reach out to us and. How do you uh, how do you feel about um, what do you think is gonna be the outcome of COVID? And when do you think that shit's gonna start to phase fizzle out? When there's a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was talking <laughs> to a couple um, people about it, and I think it's just one of those things where it's just gonna run its course. Yeah. And at this point, you know that's what it's doing. Yeah. But um, I actually don't know if do you, have you heard anything about people being able to transmit it twice like if they had it and then they got rid of it and then they got it again i haven't i don't think i've heard anything about that um because from well, what i've seen or heard i f- i think that they can get it again okay and i'm assuming if they can get it again they can transmit it <laughs> well that's the, that's what that's one thing is uh i um i'm not sure of because people are getting like they're taking like antibody tests and they come back with having the antibodies for it so then you can't get it again yeah. So I don't know. I I don't. I'm obviously, I'm the dumbest guy in the world. So I don't know how that works. Yeah, but I'm not really educated. I, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's just one of those things. Like people ask me all the time, and I just, like I just ask you, like, what do you think is gonna happen? Like, when's it? When do you think it's gonna end? It's like I don't I don't know when it's gonna end. There's I mean, everyone honest. If I'm being completely 100 percent honest, I think everybody is going to get it eventually. And what. When I was listening to the fighter and the kid, they were saying like all these numbers that are being put out are all the cases that there are, mm-hmm. but they're not sharing the data of the death rates. Granted, I know a lot of people have died from it. Mm-hmm. Millions of people have died from it, but the death rate isn't as high as what like the media projects okay. to everybody. So they're just obviously trying to scare people still to keep people inside and keep wearing the masks and shit like that. Yeah. I don't know though. I just think it needs to run its course and I feel like yeah, everyone's going to get it eventually. Yeah. I don't know if... I agree with everybody's going to get it, but I know what you mean. And it's like, yeah, well, I'm sure not a lot, not everybody, like 100% everybody. Yeah. But <laughs> that's you know, how I take the, it. The majority of people will probably, you know, come in contact with it and then it's just going to do its Definitely. thing. Definitely. Cause I've had, I just found out the other day, one of my friends, um, they had it and it was funny cause he was like, uh, and he's the first person personally that I know who mm-hmm. had it, who's had it. And, um, he was like, I thought the whole taste thing was bullshit. And then I couldn't, I really couldn't taste for like two weeks or whatever. Yeah. I was like, fuck, that's pretty crazy. Well, that's where people even think COVID's bullshit. Yeah. Like, right. Until you have it or like you personally know somebody who has it. It's all fun and games. Then until you get it. They're like, oh, this is real. Well, yeah. Like, 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 like Brian Callen, Brendan Schaub, uh-huh. the, the whole fucking first three months of it, they were just ragging on it and they were like, stay safe and everything. Right. But they were like, the deaths aren't, you know, as high as whatever, like I just said. And then they got it. They mm. they started doing stand up. They went to Arizona, oh. and then they got it there, mm. and then they brought it back. And then they're like, "Well, yeah, we have it." <laughs> it was just nice. funny. Damn, yeah. It's funny to listen to them, uh, you know, preach about how ridiculous it is that everything's right. still closed, and, and then, then they come it, back with it. People that think that maybe it's like political, yeah. or that's not real. Like, what would be the advantage of some of these people saying that they have it? You well, know? I think the whole thing. I think where it comes to be political is. Um, 
has to go into economics and really just getting Trump out of office, which is mm-hmm. why it became political. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, you know, they with with the economy so bad with like our governor just wanting everything closed at the beginning. Right. When everything was shut down, small businesses were going under like the economy is getting so bad. Oh, but Trump's president, too. Oh, it's his fault. Yeah. You know, like that's what it, not that I'm not that I'm endorsing Trump or anything, but, you know, <laughs> that's it's kind of ridiculous in that sense or that ideology in a way. But whatever. I'm I'm just stoked that, you know, places are still open and uh, the small businesses are like able to still stay open for like to go shit. Yeah. They're not making as much money that way, but it's better to stay, you know, like head barely above water yeah. when it comes to that situation. And I'm stoked that the gym's open finally. Oh, yeah. Me too. You probably heard me talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, both of us are. Yeah. I, I know I am for sure. I mean, we had our garage set up, which was... Legit. Was, Even yeah. we still use it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's still good. But that, it's just it's super nice having the gym open again. It was uh it was fine. You didn't seem to skip a beat with that. No, no. I, maybe at first yeah. it was hard. Well, before we got it all set up, trying to do it in my room or the backyard or something, it's it's hard, you know, to keep that motivation and stuff like that. But once we got that set up and dialed in, I knew that if I did it at the same time on the same days that I could stay consistent. Yeah. And you remember like how long I've been doing this too. Right, right, right. For over 10 years, I've been consistent in yeah. fitness. And so for me, it's easier. And for me, it's it becomes a habit. Like mm-hmm. after you do this for so long, it becomes a habit and it's actually almost harder to not, not to yeah. work out than yeah. it is to stay consistent. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, because right at the beginning of quarantine, I was just drinking so much. I was yeah. just so unmotivated and like I got, I was like, yeah, and if you're home all day, yeah, it's yeah. like I'm I'm doing nothing all day, and then I'm like exhausted from doing nothing. That's right. That's how <laughs> I am. Yeah, and uh, yeah, w- once you got that all set up, I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I had some pretty solid workouts in there, but then I was telling, um, I think I was telling Enzo how I I just feed off of the gym environment, like the at, energy. Yeah, like after mm-hmm. working out here for two months, I was just like, I, you know, I'm just. I'm I'm at home. It's so easy for me to. That's where the weak mindedness kicked in. Yeah, and I just like you I, can train. You got you, yeah. You train your mind just like a muscle. Yeah, it's I, true. I was doing my workouts and then like started cutting them a little shorter and stuff like that. And then the gyms yeah. opened up and I was just like, "Fucking, let's go." Yeah, that's the whole thing. What helped is uh, you know each time I would work out in there is as you know I would do I would come up with some oh, idea. Yeah, in like gym, mounting like, the TV yeah. in there or putting up the shelves. I had some shelves just sitting in there, and so I'd look around as I was working out. I was like what can I do, you yeah. know, to this place? And I had some pictures of Arnold in my closet that I never hung up in, in my room. And so I hung those up in there. I was like, oh, it's an appropriate place, you know, just to help motivate. motivate yeah. And it's like, on, so I would put the motivation, the bodybuilding motivation videos from YouTube on that TV, put the music on, just like have the, the pictures of Arnold, have my trophies in there, moving them from the living room to in there. Yeah. Kind of creating that the rave lights that energy the the party rave lights in there <laughs> like whatever it takes yeah to just motivate because then it kind of makes it exciting it's like a to fun be environment yeah 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 because yeah. yeah. you you are missing that energy of the other people that right. you do have in the not gym. even like that you're trying to like show off or anything no. but just like you know there's other people getting their fucking workout fix in and yeah like you're like all right stoked all right sick you're here yeah. too let's get it and then i think i i post on my story or something sometimes or i go ig live i was in there just yeah that also is kind of motivational yeah and holds you accountable right is when i go like ig live while i'm working out because then there if, if there's some people watching like you you gotta be you gotta, working out yeah exactly yeah, yeah. you're you gotta just gotta gonna be, be sitting there it. you keep you entertained too and so you have the whole setup and it was kind of cool but um but yeah again being in the in the gym is nice because even when the gym was open pre-covid it was all about the energy because I remember right. going in there when I used to go on the weekends into the gym and there's like nobody in there. You're like, uh, yeah, I wasn't, you wouldn't feel it. No. You, you, you wouldn't feel like being in there. So I'd walk in there, there would be barely anybody in there, low energy. And then what I would sometimes do, cause I have super sport membership too. Mm-hmm. And I knew there was going to be either just cause it was a different scene or I knew there was going to be more people, which there usually is at the Redwood city yeah. super sport. And so every once in a while I would go to San Carlos, it was nobody in there and I'd drive over to Redwood city. Yeah. It was like an exit away and I would work out there Yep, and have a better work just up the for the energy. Bit. Yeah. The, that's the why scene, I like the energy. That's why I liked when we would go to Wesca, right? Which we got to go Definitely. back there when, it, you know, they open. Yeah. Hopefully they don't. Well, they're opening under. Monday. Oh, they are opening. But they have, um, the appointment thing. Oh, that's right. Very limited. Yeah. I remember Santa Clara County is opening Monday. They're probably so not even going to do the 24s. guests then. Uh, you can, you just have to email them. Oh. 
Yeah, and they'll still do like uh, tours yeah. and things from what I was watching. But um, yeah, no, I was just going to say the, again, the Switching energy the level scene, in the gym. It's like sure. it, when it's busy, it's like, yeah, it can be annoying because there's more people in there and the you machines that you want, shit. you have to wait for shit. But the energy level is high at least. Mm-hmm. So you're going to get a good workout because you're, like you're vibing Monday, off of other Monday people's workout. energy yeah. or people looking at you while you're working out. Yeah. Versus when there's nobody there, you have free reign of the place, right? You got all the machines are open, this and that, but then the energy level's low. Yeah. So it's kind of a trade off. Yeah, that's why <laughs> like just working out in the gym for me, I was just like, I'm not seeing my gym crushes here. <laughs> this is kind of shitty. I yeah, could motivation. be just trying <laughs> to do some bicep curls in front of them and then I'm just by myself. Uh, you missed out on EDC this year. Yes, we did because of COVID. Because of COVID, I mean, it's still scheduled. I believe even today, it's still scheduled for October. For October. Yeah, but will it actually happen? We don't know. Probably not. But we don't know. Or if it was in October, would you still go? Yes. Okay. So you. So still... me, Clark, Canna, yeah, would probably go. Yeah. Um, th- if it did happen, we're assuming there'd be less people there. Yeah, for sure. You know, which might be nice. Yeah. I mean, even though same thing as the gym, right? right? More people there, more energy. Yeah. But then more people there, then it's harder to get closer to the stage or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. So there's kind of a, a give and I've take. I've seen to each. some. Uh, I don't know if I've seen people go to EDC all the time, and it it looks fucking hella fun. Yeah, and I haven't been guys... there since 2011. So. Oh, it's been that long for me. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. When you were competing that, yeah. Yeah, that was the last time I went to EDC. Damn. And I uh, needed to go back. You you guys got me into that scene a little bit. Yeah, we brought you along. Yeah. yeah. We, Th- that to was dope. Two events. Yeah, I went yeah. to Audiotistic. Yep. Really to see Juice World, but that's where like my eye opened to that kind of scene. For anybody, I yeah. feel like people have a preconception of how raves are or yeah. those EDM events are. But until you go, you don't know for sure. That's yeah. why people that hate on it, I'm like, have you been to one? Yeah. No. Like, no. Well, why would I go to that? Exactly. Like, just go. Like, it's. You just it's gotta, not what you think. Like, yeah, but most not, of the, most of the time, not even just go. Like, if you yeah. have friends that are into that, right? And you have friends that. Oh yeah, it like, depends on who you're with too. Yeah, you're right, if you have yeah. like a good taste, or if you have a uh, friend group. Or even just a friend that has like a good taste in what they think is good, mm-hmm. then yeah, that would be solid. Like if you have it like makes a difference. even if you have like two or three friends that are going to a concert, just fucking tag along. You right. Know? And that's Why what not? I did. That's it's what I did experience. with you guys. Yeah. I mean, if I'm being honest, I went because Juice World is gonna be there, which by the way, I'm really glad I went. Right. And then But just bonus. Yeah, but you even, got Juice World there exactly. and you got and then other even, stuff to experience. Even before he went on, like because mm-hmm. he went on later in the day, like at nighttime. Yeah, it was nice. And night. before that, it was fucking hella fun. Right. Like it's cool, like <laughs> Like the vibes, dude. You yeah, know? like the vibes with everybody. <laughs> everyone's in a fucking good mood. Everyone's probably on drugs, but that's fine. Yeah, but it, it, everyone's like dancing, smiling, just having a good time. And, and there's then, a there's a difference that you notice between other genres of music. Yeah, oh, events yeah. that yeah. you go to other concerts. Right. So it's like the hip hop and rap scene. That's a certain because I go to those too sometimes. Yeah. And then I've been to country concerts. Shore, sloppy shoreline sloppy Hell shoreline yeah. so i've gone to those so if I, i've experienced the different vibes yeah. you know the different atmospheres and, and then, environments and then res was the next one res was and that was indoor at bill yeah. graham yes so so even the difference if you go to edm events even the difference between being in an outside one outside two day like or festival or whatever compared to just a one night indoor yeah place it's different so right? much different and i'm more of like I really I like the vibe of the outdoor more. Mm-hmm. However, like audiotistic was so much fun because I like drinking outside right. in the sun. Yeah. But the Day fucking drinking. <laughs> but the sound of and like the visual aspect yeah. being inside in the dark with the lighting and so shit. So they both have their dude, advantages. That was insane. Yeah, especially if you're drinking or you're you're on some substance or drugs or anything. Yeah, it usually being indoor it's, it might intensify it even more for sure like in a good or bad way but yeah yeah dude i i really i was looking forward to because were you guys in good audio autistic this year you guys uh if it was happening no no no. if it was going to yeah yeah if, if it, was, it, was, if it was gonna happen uh i don't remember maybe <laughs> i wonder actually because you guys i don't would, know you guys would have had just gone to edc yeah that's yeah. true so it, well, it depends anyways, on how we felt but anyways i was gonna say definitely um, go to more yeah i was yeah. gonna say i, I totally would have tagged along with you guys if you guys did go to more of them yeah because yeah those are it's like different because i 
I'm obviously I'm like a big rock concert goer. Mm-hmm. So I like going to bands, seeing bands that I love seeing. Yeah. But then like just having a different perspective on like concerts and like going to see some shit that I have no knowledge of. Right. And just like seeing that, seeing how other people perceive it too. Like obviously people are going because they fucking love that kind of shit. Right. Going that, going to that. I like to I like to look at people. Cause like oh yeah, it's but, great for looking at people. Yeah, yeah compared but, to like almost any other genre, well, like, I, I even like, like a rock show, I yeah. would say like yeah, there's the mosh pits, but you're mostly there for the music and the band. Right, like everybody's focused on that. And then in rap too, everybody's like just drinking, and they're more focused on the music and the rap. And shit, yeah, yeah, and then on uh, in the uh, what's another genre that I'm thinking of? Country, country, yeah. It's like yeah, people are drinking, having a good time, and they're singing along. Like that's basically what it is. It's still very that but, based, uh, my, but during EDC. Yeah. It's like everybody's vibing with each other. Right. It's like, yeah, the music can sometimes just be in the background. Yeah. You know, or you are focused on the music sometimes, but it's nice too that you can just have it go in the background and you can just vibe with people right. and interact with people. I just like seeing people's excitement for shit like that. Oh, yeah. Like, like the light shows and all that going on. You see how people yeah. are into that. Yeah. Everyone like jumping around and shit like that. Like, I fucking love that, dude. Like, yeah. that's that's probably the only no thing. No judgment. I miss. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, I'm. I think the number one thing I miss about or throughout this whole COVID shit is uh, concerts. Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to go to a lot of concerts this year, stagecoach obviously, and more raves with you guys. And that's like, I, I feel like I don't even really go to enough of them in general, but now that this happened, I'm going to go to whatever ones I can when this fucking shit opens up again. Yeah. Cause that's like, I feed off of that. Right. And it's like such a treat too, when you get to see just great performers and shit like that. Yeah. And I need those vibes again. I think everybody <laughs> needs those vibes again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we had that little um, get together for Fourth of July. Yeah, which here. I'm bummed that I missed out on. Yeah, but I mean, Tahoe's great. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it was fun for sure. Yeah. I told you about the incident. Everyone knows about it. Whoever listened to my last episode. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was no, it was really fun. But there is something about waking up in my own bed yeah. that I just missed, especially yeah. over the past two weekends. I haven't been home, so waking up yesterday in my own bed on the first on the weekend it was like oh my god i don't have to do anything right now so this is fucking nice right that's what was kind of nice about fourth of july last weekend yeah you got you got the setup in the backyard and yeah we started like a three or four in the afternoon and we had uh we grilled up a lot of food a lot of food we grilled up food we had music going um and then as it got dark we have the string lights set up over our backyard so those turned on and then I brought out the TV and speakers, and uh, there we tuned into a live stream of some EDM artists. Yeah. And I brought out the rave lights mm-hmm. and hung them up out there as well. Make and then fun. had the tiki torches going. Um, we have a little like fire pit thing. Yeah. Uh, we had that going, so it was a cool environment. And then environment, the neighbors cool are doing vibes. their own fireworks. Yeah. So we just were chilling back there watching the live stream, and just perfectly right where we're sitting, all we had to do was look up, and there's fireworks going on yeah and i'm surprised right that near our backyard yeah like no cops came not that we noticed i'm sure they were all around busy that yeah, night but yeah, yeah but yeah they were doing them almost all night and they're like the big mortars that yeah. would shoot up in the air and explode, explode like yeah. legit fireworks and you were like oh this is this is just like edc you yeah, know because no. you have the dj going on the tv and then you have the Lights fireworks going shit. i mean nothing close to yeah. edc but still it's like Nothing the like COVID a, version. Nothing like a EDC. Redwood City backyard EDC show, dude. Yeah, and we got the Redwood City River in our backyard. Mm-hmm. I don't know if any of the Redwood City locals they call probably, it that as well. They probably know. With the Redwood City River, the drainage ditch. Yeah. You get the critters coming out of it, but we're on the the north side of them. Yeah. It comes to a, a corner right here. We're right mm-hmm. on the corner of it. So I was saying, yeah, we're on the north side and the west side of hey, those people. So gang, yeah, we're holding it, holding it down on the northwest of the Red City River. Yeah, we live in a good spot, Red City. This yeah. is like a pretty good neighborhood, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. we have yet to find our or <laughs> meet any of our neighbors really, other than this, <laughs> other than the senior citizen next door. Yeah, and the people are always on their garage on the corner. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I think I said this on the podcast. The neighbor has a hot daughter. Oh yeah. She has a boyfriend, which sucks. I think it's uh. You said daughter, right? Wait, His yeah. Daughter? No, yeah. he has a hot son. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. No, I just didn't know you said like a, a, a hot girl next door. Yeah. Um, What do you think we're going to do after uh, Jake leaves? Uh, I don't know. We got to find we a new person. We got to find a new roommate. Yeah. Who's, who's out there? Yeah. Yeah. Who you, if anyone needs a roommate, <laughs> dude, you want to live with us two schmoles. Inquire about it. We just, can give you more deets. Yeah. We got to make sure you're not a lurk. 
Yeah, you know, we'll do interviews. Can't be a lurk. Um, you have to listen to my podcast. Um, <laughs> we'll put out a, <laughs> we'll put out a Craigslist ad. Yep. Oh, God, I mean, that's how sketch. we found Jake. I think. Oh, is it? I think Facebook or or Craigslist. Yeah, yeah we'll figure it out. We got something a like that. Months. Yeah, yeah. I think what he said, like the end of September, October. And yeah, October yeah, beginning yeah. of September, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. But anyways, dude, I think we can. Uh, unless you got something else you want to talk about. Uh, not that I can think of, but I'm sure I will think of more things yeah. and we can have a, we were going to do like current events and stuff like that. that. Yeah, yeah. We'll for sure do that. I mean, I'm always here. Yeah. So yeah, we, I mean, we if you li- guys want to, we live together. Want me back on, you can request <laughs> it too. But, um, as I'm right here. So. Yeah. He's in room over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plug your, um, your business. Instagram, one more time. Instagram oh. business again. Yeah. Business is origamis.com. O R O G A M I S.com. Um, we're not really that active on Instagram, but it's at Origamis, I believe. And then uh, my personal Instagram is at Frankly Shredded. Frankly Shredded. Frankly Shredded dot com. Hell yeah. <laughs> Everything's Frankly Shredded. Yes. Good shit. All right, Juicers. I hope you, if you're still listening, I really fucking love you. You guys know that. This is episode 31. Next one is 32. I have yet to find a guest, but I'm sure I will. Um, the solo episodes have been a little whatever, but that's fine. <laughs> I got to do. You need them to break I, them up. Yeah, yeah. I got to do my best when uh, I don't have any guests on. So uh, appreciate you guys. Hope you enjoy the episode, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Later. See ya. It's